Today I'm chatting with Wendy from Wendy's Lookbook. Wendy is an OG and iconic fashion blogger based in New York. She first started her YouTube 12 years ago and since then has grown her blog and her Instagram where she places most of her focus on now. Wendy is a new mom and she shares with us how her personal brand has evolved over the years and also her biggest lessons learned from running a retail business and working with brands. I've been a huge fan of Wendy since before my influencer days so it's amazing being able to sit down with her and chat intimately like this. I remember bumping into Wendy in 2018 in London and I was super shy but I approached her for a photo and she was very very nice about it. I know you're going to learn so much from her and get a lot out of this conversation. Dream your future, create it today. Welcome back to the Full-Time Influencer Podcast. So today we have Wendy in the car with us and we are going to chat with Wendy who is a very OG blogger, creator, influencer, whatever title you prefer. And we're going to talk about her journey and all of the things along the way that have happened because she has had she has been around for a long time and I'm sure we can learn so much so thank you so much for being on here agreeing to meet Wendy I would love to maybe start from two sentence intro well Tina thank you so much for having me and thank you for so much for driving all the way over here too. <laughs> of um I'm Wendy and I started in the online space about 12 years ago and actually in 2010 wow. and back then there was not that many of us especially actually Asian yes. Americans too mm. um, those are the days of Michelle Phan mm -hmm. um, those are days of of makeup tutorials yes. um, but I saw there was a need um, and maybe a missing side to it which was fashion mm. uh, fashion was integrated in, in makeup but they didn't have its own category and I've always loved fashion ever since I was a little girl um, loved loved magazines so I thought maybe I can just venture into that world that I can control meaning I can produce my own content mm. so I started kind of on YouTube that way and then it grew into more of a publication meaning um, an online digital uh, blog and then as social media evolved I was able to transfer it over to Instagram and now I'm here with you <laughs> yeah wow that was a very brief rundown of everything that happened so you first started your YouTube channel 12 years ago yes. and I, I remember those videos because those right. were the days when they were literally just like 10 viral videos on YouTube <laughs> and we watched them all like the Michelle Fine Val Val Valentine's Day makeup Lady look. Gaga yes. yes and then your um, how to wear heels yes because I was learning how to I was just starting to really get obsessed with heels i was learning how to wear oh, heels you're so funny. and then the uh, 100 ways to wear a scarf yeah, well, 25 those. you're so sweet oh, okay. yes, i wish i wish i can do 100 there's a lot of thumbnails and i was yes, like yes, wow, yes. that's a lot of ways to wear a scarf <laughs> and so that's when you first started yeah. so after that when did you transition to blogging yeah so i mean i think if we were to take it back a little bit mm -hmm. um you know i actually learned about fashion through online forums. Mm. Um, I was actually um, in finance. I was I was a, a business banker <laughs> um, wow. for a very long time. And then when I would get home at night, I would just just completely throw myself in this world of forums. And forums were the precursors of blogs, yes. right? And, you know, and barely anyone had their own little blog and they would just insert uh, their destination when they were talking about something on a forum. Yeah. And that was really my first introduction to what a blog was at the time. Mm. Um, but forums gave me the sense of community. It gave so much information. I mean, I learned how to identify fake bags on forums. Mm. Um, I learned, like, it's just a breadth of information. Yeah. So when I saw that people, especially women, were in charge of kind of their own views and publications, that was when the world of blogging opened up, which mm -hmm. was kind of kind of tailing this forum, you know, community. And at the time, there's not that many bloggers, yeah. you know, there's like barely any, just like YouTubers, there's many that many bloggers. But we wanted to start on YouTube because it was just, I think, a, a more engaging creative outlet at the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so... We wanted, we meaning my my previous partner who was actually also now is my ex-boyfriend. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted, he wanted, he was very interested in film um, and just kind of, kind of recording and, and, and videography and everything. And for me, fashion was always something that I loved. So I, I guess maybe I knew that in order to create a sustainable brand, I had to develop more of a television kind of showcase, meaning yeah. themed videos, right? right? So they were not just random kind of 
outfits or anything like that. Yeah. So we created a, a concept called pairings. Mm. So I would take one item and show people how to wear it three ways. Mm. At the time, I mean, I was on a budget. I mean, everyone was on a budget. We, yes. you, we didn't get paid or anything like that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that fits very well to kind of what you and your class is about too, you know, the monetization of this world. Um, so that was just very close to me, meaning I wanted to be able to wear something three different ways, 10 different ways, whatever different ways. Yeah. So we created this uh, kind of show format. And from there, um, the fourth video we did was 25 ways to wear a scarf. Mm. And we filmed it in I a Brady see. Bunch style. Yeah. And that took us, oh my gosh, you, know, you probably laugh at it now because you're a, a queen editing. No. Um, but that took us weeks. Really? And, and all of it was in one take. Wow. So because there was 25 of me on the screen. Oh. Uh. Every 20, everyone, every, t every take of the 25 was one take. So wow. it sometimes it took us days to do girl seven, you know, oh, and that wow. was the, yeah. So I would stand there from one to seven. And then when seven was my turn, I would do it. Then I would stand there again and wait it out to 25. Wow. That's right? really um, And then, you know, at the time there were a few other scarf videos out there. And one of the things that I really wanted was eye contact. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to look into the camera um, without looking pass her down the camera and we couldn't get away like we couldn't get around that because the camera blocked my neck mm. so I couldn't view my scarf so we actually filmed the whole thing through a one-way mirror wow. because I can actually look at myself while making contact and doing everything else too so it just took so much problem solving but yeah you know in the end you know it kind of launched it my career up. yeah yes. yeah and, so that know. was your first viral video yes oh. that was I, I actually thought you know, whatever YouTube broke because I I didn't I, you know how that is right? <laughs> yes, yes. When something happens, I'm like, wait, this this feels There's unexplainable. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that video at the time and still now has traveled to more countries wow. than I've ever traveled oh, to. Wow. Yeah. Yes, so I, I you know that kind of launched it and yeah. And now the world of video, com you know, is very very different. Yeah. And do you still continue YouTube nowadays or not really? I wish. You know, I think YouTube is a long as you know, it's more of a of, of a, a longer format than. Yeah. What we know now, right? Yeah. And the filming is very different too. Yes. It's more vertical than and horizontal. And I know that you know YouTube has its own version, mm -hmm. you know, too as well of reels and stories, yeah. right? Um, and the format's also different. So it's I think it's very. Um, I admire people who can do both mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I feel like you have to exert twice the effort to, yes. to capture so. one episode of the same thing. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and I, I know that you know you can watch your phone through YouTube. It's not the same as filming it yourself. Yeah. You know? I, I, one day I would like to go back, but I think I just have to figure out what my added value is now. Mm, I see. At the yeah. stage yeah. Right, versus before. Yes. Did you ever get into, oh, we're going to get into the blogging part, but uh, while we're on the topic of YouTube, did you ever get into vlogging at all? Or was it mostly like how to's? Yeah. So vlogging, oh, you know what? I don't find myself to be a very interesting person, period. I don't know if that sounds weird, but I'm the I, same. You're right. Mm -hmm. And I think naturally as an introvert, I just like, I don't, I don't yes. find what I do very interesting. Yes, yes. And I, I, I can, and I'm not, I can't really pretend it that it is. So it was really difficult for me to vlog. And mm. I think stories are different now because they're shorter mm. and they're more of a snippet of things, yes. right? But vlogging back then was like 30 minutes, yeah. you know, 45 minutes. And I, I just felt like I didn't have enough, you know, mat not material, but talking points to, yes, in, to yes. add value for that long. Yeah, you know? I agree. So it was, it was, I think that format is very tough for me and it continues to be very tough mm, for me. I see, see. I, I have the same problem. I, I, uh, I'm at a loss of words in mm. front of the camera when I'm by myself mm -hmm. and all the adjectives I use are the same and I realize, oh no, I'm not descriptive enough oh. or like super interesting enough to, to do a vlog. Well, I, I think, you know, it's funny because I watch all of your stories, right? And, and I think stories are like the modern vlog of, yeah. of today. I find you interesting, even though you might not find yourself interesting, but I think that's the... Um, um, characteristic of an introvert, right? Yes. Like you, you might not find Maybe, it, but yeah. for me, when I, I mean, I watch all of it and I find it very interesting. So mm. whatever you're doing, you know, keep up whatever you're doing. I have to say with stories, there's a lot of intention behind it mm. and a lot of thinking. So I always am thinking like, is this interesting to my viewer? Mm -hmm. And how can I make a going to eat dumpling story more interesting mm -hmm. than not? And that is just sort of the effort that goes behind mm -hmm. it. And so that's when I knew that, oh, I, I can't do vlogs because if mm -hmm. I have to come up with effort every day to make my boring life interesting, oh gosh, so it would take so much effort in addition to everything else we're also trying to do, you know, right. in our personal brand. So right, right. that was the rationale behind it. So after YouTube, you decided to move to the blog format? Yeah. So the blog was actually in conjunction or in parallel mm, to YouTube. Um, meaning because, you know, when you watch an episode, 
episode, if you wanted to go back and, and at the time too, you know, photos are very important. Yeah, you know, photos might not you know be as important now <laughs> on Instagram as you know. Um, but back then, photos were very important. They wanted yeah. to see the styling. So. In a sense, when you were watching it, it's almost like a secondary resource for you when you can actually see the outfit on a page, yeah, you know? Yeah. So I think there was a lot of added value for blogging, um, mainly because it kind of gave, you know, our audience uh, another perspective or view of what yeah. we were doing. And and blogging was just different. You yeah. know, it, it took a lot more effort for you to read something mm -hmm. as an audience member than to watch something passively sometimes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then also writing is a lot more effort, you know, yeah. because then you kind of have to uh, kind of explain what what the styling is or whatever it is that, that, that you're doing. Um, and I really enjoyed writing. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, blogging was just like a nature where I wanted to share, you know, kind of the static version of what we were doing on video already. I see. You know, it, I see. it doubled the work though, because you had to go out and actually take photos of what you just filmed. Yes. But at the time, you know, it, it was a, a, a really fresh and new concept. Yes. Yeah. And you had a, was it a weekly installment of blogs? Yeah, no, I used to blog uh, every other day. <gasps> oh, wow. I know. And then oh I used to goodness. YouTube uh, twice a week. Oh, oh my wow. gosh. I mean, I mean, your workload's incredible. But I, I mean, you know, back then, that was... Oh, that was the the pattern, right? Wow. It was like you know YouTube at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, mm. and most of the time it's twice a week. Uh, we would do a creative, like like you know, um, a creative meaning like something like twenty five ways to wear a scarf yes. at least once a month or once every two months, yeah. you know, and that took us forever, you know, and then to support that we would blog um, about three or four times a week. Mm. So every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I see. Yeah, so then with the blog, was that where it started to take off and you started to see viewership go up because it went hand in hand with the YouTube channel and yeah. there was discoverability on the blog itself? Yes. You know, I think um, I think there's a lot of synergy between the two in that mm -hmm. way. Uh, what made the blog very intentional for me was that I wanted to make sure not only to capture outfits that I was sharing on YouTube, but to capture outfits that were not shared on YouTube. Yeah. So there would be more added value once I you see. stopped in the blog. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if, I, if I were to share share something I wore already, it was very minor to something that maybe I restyled yeah. for just the blog. Yeah. And then I would restyle again for Facebook. Because yes, back yes. then, Facebook was also uh, okay. another medium, you yes. know, that, 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 that we had to use. Um, I was not too big on Twitter because I yeah. think it was just too short for me. And I didn't, I didn't quite catch kind of my added value on mm -hmm. Twitter is. But the three formats were huge. You yeah. know, and Pinterest too, actually. Yes. Yeah. So we would just, you know, restyle everything and would make things very unique depending on the medium that we were working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then after the blog really started to take mm -hmm. off, how has it evolved till now? Because nowadays in the last, I would say, two, three years, some people are saying blogging is dead mm -hmm. or viewership is down. And I, I even know some fashion influencers who have just scrapped their blogs mm -hmm. altogether mm -hmm. Um, although, of course, I, I don't know the reason. Mm -hmm. I didn't speak to them personally. How do you feel about that when people say that blogging is dead? You know, it's so funny because um, I do think viewership is down mm -hmm. uh, on blogging sites because you can get access to so much more information yes. on one platform mainly Instagram, mm -hmm. right? So before, you know, on a blog, there were links embedded. So, so you yes. knew exactly what to like, click on if you wanted that jacket, dress, or whatever it is, boots. Now you can swipe up. Yeah. So I think having it kind of traffic to one area made all of the other mediums so difficult to kind of uphold and maintain, mm -hmm. you know? So yes, I, I, I do think that there is, it's harder to do both, yeah. right? I, it wasn't a mistake, but I made a, an effort to vamp my, I spent a lot of money to redo the whole blog. Because, you know, back then, yeah. you know, um, the format was very different. Yeah. It was, um, oh my gosh, it was blogger, right? Yes, like yes. They have the, the, the blogger format and it was very simple and was very easy. And yeah. then it became more editorial. Yes. Right. Yes. It started looking like a magazine and everything. And I felt like as a brand, I needed to make it more editorial to keep up with the publication side. I see. So we spent a lot of resources in making and And the, the site I, I love at the end, you know, the formatting and everything. But then that's when Instagram started producing all of these features, mm. right? So um, so in, in a way, I, I have a very soft spot for the blog because yeah. that's where I kind of, you know, really foster this community, yeah. you know? Um, but it's hard because... It's it's not about workload anymore. It's about usability. Yeah. Right. The functionality is very different. Yes. Before, 
I think for now, I think because we're so busy, uh, you don't want to click on a button that mm. leads you to another button that leads you to another exactly, button. Exactly. Yes. Right. So you want to click on a button and get your answer, then you move on. Yes. And you can buy everything online, meaning through your phone now. Yeah. You don't need a computer to go and search and cross reference anymore. Mm-hmm. You know. So, yeah. I think it's hard. You know, and I think I I like that when we had a blog or blogging was a focus that was a thing that we owned as content creators like yes. no one can take that away from us yeah. now we just have to kind of split that ownership to instagram or, yeah. or to you know whatever other medium there is and that becomes a little bit more challenging yes definitely the whole idea of having ownership over your audience or the outlet where you're posting all of your content is something that's very important and growing nowadays like a growing discussion right Mm -hmm. i feel like with the blog it was definitely something where oh it was great to have your own domain but then ultimately it would be like having your own store but you still need foot traffic. Mm -hmm. So you still need to put it in a mall for people Mm -hmm. to notice you. And Mm -hmm. then maybe when they go somewhere, they'll go to your actual store. It's kind of like that. Yes. Um, So it is nice to have the ownership. But nowadays, given that all of the foot traffic is in the mall called Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, it's just a different world now. Well, not only that, but like imagine if the mall just all of a sudden closed. Yes. Like, for example, Snapchat. Right. Like I I never got into Snapchat. It kind of kind of kind of scared me because I didn't understand what how that that formatting was. Um, But so I never got on it. And when it honestly, when it went away, I was like, great. Like now I can just do it on Instagram, you know. So but imagine as a content vine. That's yeah, another one, right? Yes. So imagine being a content producer on Vine and on, on Snapchat and all of a sudden it goes away. That must be honestly quite tragic yeah. that you spent all this effort and all of a sudden it goes. But I, I, I think that's that's the, the hard part to navigate this world. Yeah. So outside of the blog, do you also have an email list where you can retain your audience? Yeah. You know, I think we, we wanted to do that. And I think it was just... I just, you know, maybe it goes back to the whole thing about me thinking I'm not very interesting. I just don't want to bother you. <laughs> I don't know, right? It's, it's terrible. It's just like, I know as a businesswoman, I should be on top of it. Yeah. Um, but a part, we did have one, but I just didn't, I feel like unless I was sending you something that was valuable, I just didn't want to bother you because I think if I bothered you, then you would just be more irritated with me mm-hmm. as a brand to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know, Even though you might not feel that way, mm-hmm. right? Yes. As, as a receiver, I felt that way. So in a lot of ways, I just, that, that, side of it never kind of kicked in mm. are, you, are you a huge fan of email list? email list so now that i have a product i i am a huge fan mm. of email lists because um ultimately if the platforms go away i can still email to my audience and i know that a part of them will still buy yeah so um alex homozi he's a businessman so he talked about how like if all of your traffic gets taken away no paid traffic no organic traffic you just have your email list can you still make money Mm -hmm. and that was a very important question too that I had to ask myself like will my audience still buy my stuff Mm -hmm. if I can only just contact them via email Mm -hmm. and fortunately the answer was yes but also because I I don't have that many products yet so I haven't really saturated like all kinds of topics in Mm -hmm. terms of products so that was an interesting question to consider but now what I feel is that these malls like the instagram youtube malls my plan is just to go all out on all these platforms so that you're kind of omnipresent Mm -hmm. so that if any of these go away it won't matter because something some other platform will pop up Mm -hmm. and then all you need to do is claim your handle Mm -hmm. and people will have that instant recognition Mm -hmm. so it's no longer a i'm an instagrammer Mm -hmm. or i'm a youtuber or i'm a tiktoker no i'm just like i'm just a personal brand online Mm -hmm. i'm just a creator online people will always recognize me wherever i go do you find that very stressful Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, because I, 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 I totally understand what you're saying, and I totally agree with what you're saying. I'm just curious, as a content creator, because you know I watch you all the time. Like, does that keep you up at night? Um. Yes. Yeah. Everything keeps me up at night, and there's so much stress involved with creating content. And I think in the beginning it was fun because mm-hmm. we enjoyed the content format. Mm-hmm. It was just a creative outlet. Mm-hmm. But when it becomes a pretty big income stream, mm-hmm. and I know this is ironic, and by no means am I complaining, but it's just when it does become that, then it's a stressful responsibility, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And now you have family too, mm-hmm. and I have a husband, and like he quit his job. Mm-hmm. Not that he's my responsibility, mm-hmm. but we also plan to have children. Children mm-hmm. soon, so all of that becomes very stressful. Knowing that you have to evolve and mm-hmm. continue to grow, or else you do kind of get left behind. 
And I and I've I've seen that, you yeah. know, because you know a lot of my peers that I saw mm. or that I was with, or the, or the class that I was with, when I was on YouTube, like not everyone could have, not everyone transferred over to Instagram successfully, or to, you know, whatever Snapchat at the time or or you know um, TikTok now. So I, I think I, I've seen and I also seen comebacks. Yeah. Right. Where yeah. you're like, oh, you know, wow, I I totally forgot that that person was yes. there, and then all of a sudden they're like. They're more present now, yes, you know, yes, whatever yes. it is. So I, I think, you know, even though for me and at the same with you, I, I think this keeps me up at night a lot, mm. you know. But I also know because I've seen comeback stories, I just have to figure out what is the ad value that I can insert myself into these new platforms because every platform has a different like engagement mechanism, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and different kind of viewership. So like what can I do that makes – me feel like the most organic to me because yeah. I can't fake you know I mean you can but I think after a while you just get really exhausted yes. and people see through it right yes. so like what can I do that's organic to me that I can add value on this particular platform mm-hmm. and seeing the ups and downs of other people like not saying that like that's I'm sure that was very stressful for them you know mm-hmm. it kind of gives me hope that they're that we can problem solve when that time comes yeah and hopefully it, it doesn't have to come yeah, correct? yeah. but if it does then it's can we do that? And I, and I think the answer is yes. I think it's difficult. Yes. I think it's very frustrating. Also, yes. Yeah. But I think it's doable. So the one thing that I have come to terms with in terms of the, the social media world mm-hmm. is that everything will constantly change at a pace that mm-hmm. is extremely hard for us to keep up as individuals. Mm-hmm. If we have a full uh, business company, other people to support us, maybe it can be a bit better. Um, but what I've accepted is that this is just part of the job mm-hmm. and we have to uh, be agile enough mm-hmm. to adapt and quickly learn new skills. And that is the that is the game and we're in the game and so I I have accepted that if I can't deal with the stress I need to find other income streams Mm -hmm. that that can potentially sustain us as well Mm -hmm. and so that's one thing I'm working towards to alleviate the stress knowing that there is a backup Mm -hmm. but I I think it's just accepting that and then you'll be okay and you'll rise to the the occasion right and I I think once you accept it too you can see opportunity in other areas yeah right where it's like you know, for me, like I'm venturing to more design world, oh, you know, like the jacket yes. you're wearing, right? Yeah. So like, that's something that I've always wanted to do, but not, not have enough resources to do so. So yeah. I think, you know, now it's just going, okay, well, I can do it. I've done it and it's, it's done well. So can I replicate that with mm-hmm. other things or can I expand on it? Not mm-hmm. even replicate, expand on it, you know? So I think once you, like you said, are at peace with it, the stress is still very much there, yeah. but it's just more manageable. Yeah, And yeah. it feels like you're looking for other outlets to really widen the breadth yes. of offerings that, that you have already. Yes, yes, exactly. It's, it's a challenge that all creators have. Hey, quick break from our conversation. I wanted to tell you about my free training where I teach aspiring creators how to become paid influencers. If you're not sure how to grow on Instagram or how to actually reach out to brands, then you definitely want to check it out. In this training, not only do I talk about the foundations that you need to have, but also the content strategies that are crucial to landing paid brand deals and how to grow on Instagram and also use that content to grow across social media channels. Head to successfulinfluencer.com slash training to save your spot today. I'll also link it in the description below now back to the show so we were just talking about creators evolving as platforms update and change and new platforms appear um what has been a part of your journey because it's been a long 12 years which is really incredible (laughs) to stay consistent all this time (laughs) can you recall a time where it was more challenging for you was it the switch shift from photo to video or is Mm. it like tiktok was there a point where you felt like it was um, hard to keep up or it was challenging for you yeah I I think the shift from from photos to video was challenging you know because also at the time too I didn't do most of the video editing it was Mm. my partner that did Mm. right and so um when we kind of split ways um I I knew how to work a camera for the photography so I edited all my photos and everything so that part was fairly seamless for me I was able to continue kind of doing the blog and at the time with Instagram, it was another photo, uh, yeah, you know, platform. So then it kind of made it very easy for me yep. to transition. But once Instagram started doing video, and you know, I think I, being a YouTuber, everything was filmed on the camera, mm-hmm. right? And I really was stuck on this mentality of I need everything to be super high quality, mm-hmm. right? Like everything has to be high quality. And I, I can't film if it's not on the camera, and it. I I just felt like I was really punishing myself for not really stepping forward 
right? Yeah. And it was holding me back more than anything else because no one yes. else cared. Yes, but exactly. Me. Yeah. Um, but I think once I was able to say, you know what, let me just enjoy the filming process again, you mm-hmm. know, and enjoy the editing process. So I had to learn how to edit. And editing now is very different from yes. editing before, yeah. as you know, and I, I see all of your tutorials. So like, I think editing now is different. I think, so once I found joy in the editing process, you know, in the filming process, um, I think that made the transition much at least less hard, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was, I think the algorithm also encouraged reels. So the first reels that I put out, the algorithm kicked in and it went mm. viral on its own in that sense where I'm like, okay, it gave me a dose of encouragement yes. to go, I can yes. do it again. And you know how that is because yeah. like, I saw all of yours and I see that. So like once it hit like a million, two or three, you're like, wait a minute. I, I think, can do it. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I can do this. And I think it's maybe it was a false, not false hope, but I think it was kind of like, you know, they're fishing. They want you to produce yes. more content, right? That's so right. I get it. And then, you know, so, but that gave me just enough fire and motivation to go, I can do this. If I did it once, I can do it again. Um, and not every video performs very well, right? Yeah. And vi- there's some videos that I spend so much time on. It's like, oh my gosh, it didn't perform as well as the videos I, I you know, I did not spend as much time on. Yeah. But I think that evolution and the ability to, edit and to film and everything else just gave me this clarity of going you know your 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 last video is, is your best right yeah. so i'm going to produce it post it continue and then close it and keep on going forward yeah, yeah. And i think that helped um lessen the the the, the stress of mm. producing more video mm. i love that so just enjoying the process yeah. giving it a go and then when you see a results from your efforts then doubling down and doing more of it just right. trying it right not letting that mindset hold you back right and you know honestly if if you're doing it and you give it a go and it does not work out enjoy the process because yeah. I think if you enjoy the process, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work out or not. Yes, right? And yes. I think sometimes it just takes time. Yeah. And I think people might not be able to stick through the time for as long as they should. Right? Yes. So I think once you're able to get that process down and you feel at peace with it, and I think you have to enjoy it. I love, to this day, I love, love photo editing and I love, love video editing. Mm. I don't care what it is. I can edit your videos. I still love it. Yeah. So it, it doesn't yeah. matter what video I, I edit or who I take photos of. Yeah. I still enjoy the editing yes. process. And I think that has been kind of the steam that kept me going for all these years. That's so important. And have you seen a change when you um, started a family yes. uh, <laughs> along this process? Because um, before we hit record, we actually just briefly chatted. Yeah. And are you okay sharing your <laughs> age with us? Yes. No, oh. I I just turned 40 um, this you year. You look incredible. Oh my gosh, you're so funny. I think it's, uh, I don't know what, I think it's just the stress plus lack of sleep plus lots of skincare. <laughs> I, I mean, you it. look great. Oh, thank you very much. I thought you were my age and I'm 35. So. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a beautiful age nowadays to be able to start a family. And that's yeah. something that I think generations before us couldn't do. You mm-hmm. know, and I think we have science and we have the medical community behind us where we are able to do this you know but before so yeah so I I think it's back to your question um I think I'm very lucky that because I have this community for over a decade, they saw me go through my relationship and a yeah. breakup and a bad yeah. relationships and then, you know, call in and then now having my daughter. So it's like they've been with me throughout the whole journey. And for those who just met me now and they find out about my journey, I feel like they there's a connection there too, yes, right? Yes. So given that, it was a like it just it's the community embraced it and I was so fearful that they might not because you know I think aging is a hard topic for us yeah you know I yeah. think for content creators in general I think aging is, is you know it's it's tough and the entertainment in general right yes. aging, aging is tough um, but I think family is different right I think family is different meaning at one point if you don't have a family you dream of having a family or you dream of having a family that's not yours that might be better right so I think in that sense this sense of family whether you have a baby or not continues with that community yeah you know? so I, I saw the evolution of that as I started my own family yeah so do you find that having a family online does that um it doesn't make your job harder in terms of the time that's needed to do content because there's a lot that we have to do to keep up with all right, of the platforms right. different formats and everything right, right. people's attention get sca- attention spans getting shorter is that something you you can still you feel like it's still okay juggling with family life? Yeah. So I guess I, I'm asking this for personal I <laughs> No, no. And, and, and I'll tell you, and I'm, very, I'm very, you know, truthful and honest about this. So, you know what? Actually, that's very secondary. You know what? The first part is actually privacy. Mm-hmm. So 
so someone told me this before I had a family, before I met Colin. I was mm. actually on set working on, on a project. Yeah. And she had a baby at the time. And she was actually a makeup artist doing my makeup. And I, having a baby and being a new uh, first-time mom, I was just like, how do you do it? Like, how, do, how are you on set and do this? And she said something to me that changed my mindset. She said, when you become a mom, you become a lot more efficient. Mm. And she said that now I only take jobs I really like and yes. I don't waste time on things I don't like. Amazing. And I thought at the time we t I took any job, right? And because, you know, we were growing, we were trying to do everything. And I just could not understand how can you deny or not take a job? Mm. Because I, I wouldn't do that at the time. I get it now. Amazing. Yes, yeah. you can get jobs, you know, and you, you, of course, jobs that you love and all that. And you can also get jobs that, you know, pays the bills. You know, it, it's a part of our yes. job, you know. Um but you, your brain learns to prioritize things that you've never thought you can do. Mm. And you function on less sleep, less food, less time. But your brain is able to process all that much faster. I love that. And given that you're such an entrepreneur to begin with, you adapted this, I think, in, in a way that it will be impressive to you. Because mm -hmm. I didn't think that I was capable of doing any of this before I had, you mm. know, my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yes, I, I find time. Um, I find time between her naps. I find time after she sleeps. I find time in, in everything. To this day, it's very rare that I turn in something late, mm. even with my daughter being here. So Amazing. you just, you figure it out and you find time for that. And I think the bigger question is that at, at what age, because, you know, I share about her life a lot. She's just started standing now. And she's probably going to be walking very soon. Yeah. At what age did I go, this is enough sharing, that I keep her privacy. You know, if she goes to school, then... Maybe I have to like you know kind of tone back on the sharing. Yeah, I, mean, I, I honestly don't know. This is a new world for me. Yeah, yeah. you know. But th this is some of the things that that my mom friends talk about. You know, their philosophy is that they'll share when they're a baby, and once they become school age, they actually stop sharing. Mm, so I thought I that was see. kind of interesting. Like I, I didn't even think about that until they said it. Interesting, yeah. because we're in a new age where these creators grew. Um, as a single woman Correct. and then into marriage and then Correct. now with children and right. we first navigated our own privacy problems right, and then right. now you have to navigate it for your children right. trying to do it in a moral way right. because you can't ask for their permission right now right. but still because they're such a huge part of your life which is right. your personal brand right. some part of it is sort of not necessary we all right. have a choice right. but it is kind of important to share that part of our lives right. too right? right that's a delicate balance and i don't yeah. feel like there's a solution yet no I, I i honestly don't think so and i think for me it's that like i really enjoy sharing her because i think she's just so fun like and you know what i mean so like cute. oh thank you you know it's like when you when you really like love something you're like or enjoy yeah, something right yeah. you're like i want to share it because i really love yes. it and everything she does to me is funny or it's like yeah. fun you know and for me like i find it it's so amazing that there is this human being that gets plopped onto this earth you know pushed out or whatever you want to call it cut open whatever you want to call it <laughs> and they are completely dependent on you yes they can't like they can barely eat you they can't they can't do anything right yeah. and seeing them grow and seeing them form these incredible mechanism that we take for granted like swallowing like holding something that to me is something that i find incredibly fascinating and i want to share that mm -hmm. like i don't think that's interesting to a lot of people but for me like i thought it was just so much fun to see her eat her food fruit like yeah. you know and yeah. her first foods and all that stuff and but again, I have to figure out, like, at what point is sharing too much, mm -hmm. you know, and, yes. and navigate that side of it. Yes, yes. that That's definitely a learning lesson. Like, you have people who don't even share the faces of their children Correct. where they cover it up mm -hmm. um, or blur it. And then there's people like let's say Jessica Wang, yeah. <laughs> where she has her children be part of the campaigns right, and right. go to modeling lessons and right, so on. Right. Although they, obviously they look like they're really enjoying it. Right. But it, it's kind of a tricky thing to balance now. Right, mm. right. And I think, you know, maybe the, the, the not, the before it was like, I hate saying it, but I think that's kind of what it comes out to. But like the stage moms, right? Yeah. Like, you know, and now it's, it's a different, it's kind of the social moms. So like, at what point do you go, okay, and I think going back to what you're saying, as I think as long as you fully understand that your child enjoys this. Yes. And yes. that's, and maybe they don't know what that means yet, you know, but as a mom, I hope that you have the strong enough intuition to go they're not enjoying it anymore. I'm going to cut back. Yeah. You know, where they yeah. really love it and, you know, only share things that that's very minimal in their world. 
Yeah. You know. But there's one more thing that I do want to say. Gary V got a question mm-hmm. in one of his videos out from a parent saying, mm-hmm. how do I stop my kids from being affected by social media mm-hmm. and having the uh, them doing silly things mm-hmm. for social media, for the sake of likes and so on? And Gary V just goes, it's all about their self-esteem. Mm-hmm. If you give them a healthy self-esteem, if you bring them up so that they mm-hmm. are confident and they have good self-esteem, mm-hmm. they won't ever even have those issues. Mm-hmm. They won't feel the need to do stupid things on social media mm-hmm. to get the approval and to do all that. So I think that's one thing that as long as we keep that in mind as we are including, well, my future children, your mm-hmm. uh, Kinsley, in our social media platforms Mm -hmm. then i think they'll be okay because it's all about their own character development right not about the platform so much right 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 and you know and i think like you said that these platforms evolve right and then self-esteem never evolves as in it's always there right so i think if you're able to kind of build that foundation for them and have that solid sense of self-esteem then yes you know no matter if it's vr or you know instagram whatever it is they will have the same approach to it maybe yes there will always be new platforms i think but it's hard i mean self-esteem is hard like you know like we battle with it ourselves you know so i think it's it's a very hard thing so now having to you know having this responsibility i think it's 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 a very delicate but you know tough maneuver do you mind speaking on that a bit does the um how we react to our numbers and social media yeah. Uh, when you go through these ups and downs like we all do how does that affect you personally especially like numbers or maybe even has there been a time where gigs have slowed down right, right, and right. you start to okay. question the career yep um so i think one of the things that really helped me navigate this world is that i was not this was not my first job Mm. Meaning I worked at the bank, right? Mm. And I worked actually many jobs before the yeah. bank. So when I got onto social media, I viewed it as a job, even though it's it's my personal branding. But because I viewed it as a job, it kind of separated me from the actual mm. person, right? Mm. So I, when you grow up on a space that you think your value is based on your likes, going back to yes. what we were saying about you know, self-esteem, it really hurts. And that's what I saw young YouTubers f- falling off you know, and not feeling well Mm -hmm. because it was, it affected them so much. Yes. Maybe because I was a little older and because I had previous jobs, I just didn't, it didn't really, it affected me, but it affected me more on a business sense. Like Mm -hmm. what am I doing wrong that I can fix as a businesswoman and mm. not like what what's wrong with Wendy yes you know yes. Like, there's lots of things that are wrong with Wendy <laughs> but I, for me I'm just like that. for that part of it it kept me sane I that I was that. able to separate the two right wow. so I think if you're able to separate the two because Instagram would do anything it wants and has nothing to do with you yes right so if you're able to kind of thread it then you can save some of your sanity by having that approach mm. you know for me, I I work on my engagement. I don't care about followers anymore because I think I've reached a place where I'm I'm very lucky that yeah. I don't have to worry about that. For me, it's just purely engagement. So I go, okay, well, they weren't as engaged this, you know, and they're engaged this. What is it? Is it the format? Is it the styling? What is it? Is it the baby? It's not. So I think maybe being able to focus on one thing mm-hmm. and not multiple things, mm-hmm. meaning fo- focusing on growth and just growth, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Or focus on engagement, just engagement. They go hand in hand. Yeah. But I think the sanity part, at least you can have a plan yeah. to grow one side of it and then have another valuation, have a plan to grow another side of it. So it doesn't feel very overwhelming as trying to do everything all at once. Yes. You know, yes. especially for content creators, you are a one-man team, mm-hmm. right? So all of that falls on you. So I think having it more piecemeal can save you a little bit of, of that stress too. Mm, yes, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, that is a great advice. I actually have not heard anybody talk about it in that way where mm-hmm. you consider your online presence a business, mm-hmm. like the business side of you versus the, the Wendy that is just the real mm-hmm. you or the personal mm-hmm. you. Not mm-hmm. that there's a separation mm-hmm. between the two, right? but it's just that you treat whatever is put online as just that. Yes, correct. And that's so important. And I, th- I, I know I have, and I know so many other people have, like we forget the separation yeah and we consider whatever is put out there because it's our face yes. our name um and if it bombs that we somehow are associated with right. it even though deep down we know but then it's very hard to detach ourselves it's it's very difficult like for example you know after i gave birth postpartum it was very hard for me to get mm-hmm. jobs mm-hmm. and i i thought is it because i I've, I've gained a lot of weight um right afterwards uh during the pregnancy and right afterwards and i thought maybe it's my weight and I've never thought about that before. Yeah. Meaning because like I just didn't think that was a part of the brand, yeah. you know. Is it the weight? Is it the motherhood? Is it like I don't look 
myself anymore. And that was when I said, listen, it's just the way it's the ebb and flow of the business. And wow. that's just yeah. how, you know, that's how it is. And yes. you just need to focus on what you do best, yes. which is to heal and to get better and then you pick it up later, you mm-hmm. know, but I, you know, I go through kind of that same mentality too, you know, here and there, but on, on most days, I am very aware that what I put online is really what is my business, you know, and I, I look at what I put online, the ideal version of who I want to be, Yeah. you know, so meaning I don't get dressed up like this all the time, yeah. clearly, you know, like I'm, I'm in sweats half the time, cause, yeah. you know, of, of Kinsley and everything. But then when I get dressed up, I snap a photo, you know, on my mirror and everything. I go, well, you know what? I would love to get dressed up like that every day. I don't have the energy to do so. But posting online just gives me a feeling of like, I, that's a part of me on a, on the best day version of myself. Mm-mm-mm-mm. And that's okay too. And I don't have to post every day. Yeah. You know, I, I no. think that's hard to keep up to post every day too. Yes, yes. Yeah. You talked a little bit about how your body changes and how that may have affected jobs, but just in your head. Right. Do you think that's a part of like us aging? Because I think we're we're in that same group yeah. of, we're in that same mindset. Like, you know, right. over 35, mm-hmm. still on social media, show Showing up as ourselves Mm -hmm. every day we film ourselves like I I see more fine lines or I feel a certain way or we start to realize that filters are very important and so on like does that affect you personally in terms of how you show up or does does that hit people over 35 harder yeah am I I, am I delusional to think this no 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 I I think as we age it's just because you know what I I feel like the community gets younger Mm, right so I think because the community gets younger and, it, and and I think, you know, in entertainment, we just see old actresses aging out. So there's yeah. this feeling of fear yeah. when it comes to aging. And right, you know, and honestly, it, that's somewhat correct. You know, you see older actresses not getting as many jobs. So because we see a path, we're following the same path. Yeah. And that really creates a lot of anxiety. Yeah. You know? So I can yeah. sit here and tell you all the time, oh, my gosh, age is not a thing. It's just a number. It's really different when it comes becomes a profession. Yes. You know, yes, and yes. you have to evolve with, with that in, in a sense. So I think... With aging, you just have to be very happy with how your brand is as who you are, right? Yeah. So, for example, if you're in your 40s and you're like, I cannot wear any more skirts. That's just not my thing. Just don't wear the skirt. Yeah. Just wear whatever it is that makes you feel confident and comfortable in. Mm-hmm. So, now I think once that happens too, your community will actually see that and you attract yeah. more people that follow, have, that have the same philosophy as you do. Yeah, yeah. Versus trying to retain those that might not have been there to begin with Mm -hmm. you know so i think shedding it growing shedding it or 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 just curating right you might be cutting down on your audience too and that's okay too because the people who are staying are the people who really want to see you yeah you know i see creators having different approaches to this Mm, tell me so there are creators who really grow into their own skin and are comfortable with aging and they talk about it Mm -hmm. um or you can see it reflected in let's say the products that Mm -hmm. they work with but then i do see some of the creators where it's almost like they're stepping into another era of really trying to speak young and really Mm -hmm. trying to hop onto trends and really changing their entire brand Mm -hmm. and i think sometimes it works well because maybe that was already part of their personality Mm -hmm. but they were never able to let it out before because that wasn't the nature of mm. platforms like Instagram or even blogging because mm-hmm. without video there's very little personality to mm. see right? Right. you can you're read right. it maybe but you're very right. few people read it you're right. You're right. so then with video some of these people have really become a lot have a lot more personality Mm -hmm. maybe they even show more skin which Mm -hmm. i think is great as long as because we don't know what's going on inside their heads i think as long as they are very happy with it and they are confident with it i i'm really loving seeing people step into that different side of them but also i'm i'm it's really great to see that people are very accepting of it too you know you're right you're right yeah no i i like that perspective a lot you know i mean i think like for me, I can't do dance videos. I, I I just I've never been able to do that, and I don't I don't do that. So it's like, if I were to try to do that, you can see right through it, right? But I can imagine if someone always loved dancing and never had the opportunity to do it. Yes. And now they're whatever in their forties, and they're like, yeah. whatever, I'm gonna do it anyways. Yes. Who cares? Yes. Let's do it. Yeah. I, I I can see what you're saying, and I think that adds value. But I think it goes back to them being authentically themselves, mm-hmm. because you you can definitely ride the wave of trends. It just gets really tiring. Yeah. And you just have to have a lot of mental upkeep to be able to actually go through with it for the long haul. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then like an actual practical question. Have you seen uh, gigs just stay the same or are they generally going up? Yeah, so I think um, generally I think it's so two, two answers to that. Brands understand the importance of content creators now. Yeah. So you 
so now we see gigs that have never that have not been there before. Yes, yes. Right. But because there's so much competition, um, I find that there are sometimes very slotted, meaning mm. one Asian for that campaign. Yes. You you yes. don't understand what I'm saying. Yes. So because it's so competitive, it mm-hmm. becomes just more difficult. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not because there's more geeks or less geeks or whatever it is. The the circle gets smaller, right? So I think because of that, you just have to be in a position where you go, how do I win? Not win, but how do I give out the best type of performance to be able to continue these brand partnerships yeah, yeah. going forward? Yeah. You know? Um so it's tricky. Yeah. Right? It's, it's tricky because, like, you can be that one person that season and then they never come back again. Right, right. right. You can be that one person that one time and they never come back again. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it's a little tricky. I feel like there's this idea that as an online entrepreneur, especially with everyone blowing up, that somehow your income has to go keep going like this. Mm-hmm. You have to keep going exponentially. And I feel like you have been around long enough to know that it might go overall like this, mm-hmm. but it's more like mm-hmm. this choppy wave mm-hmm. along the way. And there will be some months or even years where it's not as amazing as mm-hmm. like your top earning year. Mm-hmm. But then as long as you're continuing to stay consistent mm-hmm. and put things out and be true to yourself, yeah. then that's ultimately what's going to keep your career going, right? Right, right. right. And I also think, you know, sometimes Brian, what I've learned is this. A lot of times brands go through an agency mm-hmm. or a PR person or whatever it is. And that time, that agency might not exist anymore two years later. Yeah. Or that PR person yeah. left five days later. Like yeah. you don't know any of that, right? But in your head, you're going, oh, that brand didn't come back to me because I didn't mm-hmm. do good. Or mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't perform very well. I yes. mean, you know, well, yeah, performance is different things. You, you kind of have to perform well yeah. to get more, you know, more um, campaigns. That's kind of underlining it and we understand that. But saying, but maybe just attributing the not having the follow-up to your own self, right? Mm. A lot of times that happens. Like people go away. Yeah. And then you kind of get stuck with this new team yeah, that's yeah. working on this brand. So my advice usually is that don't just walk yourself out of it. Yeah. And you know that you did a good job, but you have to know that you did a good job. Like, yeah. You know you have to know that you show up every time doing the best you can. That's right. And next season, the season after whatever, just come back to them because sometimes they don't even know that you existed before. Yeah. Right. Yes. And and you might pick up. I mean, that's happened to me where yeah. I'll be like, hey, I worked with, you know, blah, 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 you know, two years ago and I haven't heard anything. But I still love their product. I still use it and I still share it. Let's talk about if there's a possibility that we can you know, revisit this and that. Yeah. It might be a revisit of a longer partnership where each of the items are less in fees than it was before. Mm-hmm. It depends on the climate of the monetization process. Yes, right. Yeah. Yes. Or it might be a one a bigger campaign. Like, you don't know, right? Yeah. But I think it's just I when I was doing this, I took it very personal. And I think because it's different, right? Because you're getting paid for these gigs, not yeah. because of likes and people saying things about you, right? Yeah. That they're kind of they're a little separate. But because brands don't come back, i you know, it kinda of, it hurt. But later I found out sometimes they don't even know that you were working with them That's before. Right. That's right. So I think it's just it's leave it open, leave it, you know, come through, uh, do every time great work and then revisit that conversation later. Yeah. Speaking of brands, do you have the uh, some of the most memorable campaigns that you have done that you love? Yeah, I think the m- most memorable campaigns are usually the ones that are long term because like mm, you're working with yeah. it you know, quite often. But I think also the ones that give you the most freedom. Yes. You know, to yes. to be yourself and to you know shoot the way you wanted to shoot and everything. You know, um, Sack stuck with me throughout my whole pregnancy, and yeah. I was I really appreciated that because I was my stomach was really growing as I was working with them um i've been with biosans you know i was with biosans um, yeah. when they first started yeah like literally when they first started um yeah i was introduced to the brand and i was with them for about you know two years or so and i really mm. loved that um some ref women own you know asian as well yeah. um we see each other you know at events we chit chat you know so i think it's it's more than the collaboration and the and the campaigns it's how do you sustain the relationship if yeah. there is a possibility to sustain the relationship mm-hmm. some brands you don't even know you can't get in touch with the person who's, yes, yes you know a part of that but others you can and i think that's kind of important too as well yeah so do you have um a manager that helps you with your brand campaigns i do um i have an agency that i, I go through mm. and uh, you know listen 
sometimes you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you do. I, I, I think, don't think that you have to be successful with an agency. Yes, yes, yes. Right? You can be very successful with that. I've seen it. And I have friends who don't have agency and they do very well. Yeah. And I've seen friends with agency and they do very well. Yeah. Right? So it's just whatever's best for you and what's best for your workload. If you're the type of person who's very shy about negotiating, then have someone else rep you. Yeah. You can use an alias. I don't care. Right? Yeah, yeah. To, to the rep you. Um, but if you are very comfortable, do it yourself. And I think there's no wrong way of doing it. Mm, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And also one misconception is that by signing with an agency, suddenly they will bring you all of the deals. That's but that's usually not the case. Yeah. Unless you're signed to very, very big ones like DBA or yeah, right. maybe some other really well-known yeah. global ones that yeah. do have that roster. But yeah. otherwise, it's more just they're managing your email and negotiating for you. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I, I love my agency. I've been with them for a very long time. And, you know, and yes, we it's it's a back and forth right mm. we send each other i send them campaigns they send me offerings so yeah. it goes back and forth but you do most of the like work yourself so i'm still pitching i'm still putting ideas together well, hey mm. can you contact them again this season i have this idea for them mm. you know and if i didn't have that i would have done it myself anyways yeah that's right, right. so yeah. it's just it, there, there's no right way of doing it you, mm. you you can be very successful without an agency hey what you're watching right now is the video version of our podcast did you know that we also have an audio only podcast? If you're on the go or you don't have YouTube premium, but still want to listen to the interview, then head to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts to tune in. We also do audio exclusive weekly mini sodes where I answer one question submitted by a listener in under 10 minutes. And if you love our audio podcast, we would love for you to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. All right, back to the conversation. And I noticed that you're also branching out. Maybe you have done some before, co some collaborations before, but you're doing uh, physical products now. Yeah. So not just uh, brand campaigns. Right. Is that more of a recent thing? You've also dabbled with other collabs before, yeah. right? Yeah. So I've, um, the first collab I've ever, ever done was actually a jewelry brand by oh. Decore. That was a very, very long time ago. Um, and uh, I think from that point, it made me very interested of having physical products yes. because I, I love seeing what your imagination can do and then coming to form with it. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's always been a part of my DNA to do something because I'll look at something and be like, I wish it was like this, or I wish it was that, or I wish yeah. it was cut differently. And now I actually get to do it. So my first, I think my f recent collaboration, not my first, I think my most recent collaboration was actually with a friend. Yeah. And that was the most, honestly, like fruitful and meaningful and I mean because we text each other all the time anyways mm. and we talk all the time anyways so during all of our fittings and all of our design concepts it was facetiming you know and it was like it was very fast we yeah. were, she's an entrepreneur as well so decision making became extremely fast yeah and that's one thing that you don't get with a bigger brand right so when you're working with a bigger brand and you go hey can you like fix this yeah. sometimes it takes a few weeks for them to get back to you right. they give you like samplings or whatever but with you know cassie and i were like this color this color this color let's move yeah. on and then we, we were able to do it really fast yeah um so there's pros and cons about what kind of collaborations that you can be a part of and kind of how that affects your creativity. Yes, yes. For reference, it is a PopFlex Active yeah. collaboration yeah. with Cassie, who is, uh, she's Vietnamese-Canadian, is that right? No, she's Vietnamese. Oh, she's just yeah, Vietnamese. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and she has her own on, online yoga empire, yeah. um, but it's more than that. It's really like an entire lifestyle empire. Yeah. Yeah. And I got sent one of the jackets I saw <laughs> and it's really beautiful Aww. it's really warm and the, the collection was very successful Aww, thank you so much I think the jacket sold out right yes it did it, yeah. it, it was it sold out a lot faster than we anticipated yeah. um, so we you know to be completely honest with you we weren't thinking about doing a rerun oh. We thought, oh we'll be done and then yeah. and then you know maybe we'll revisit it later yeah. but it did so well that we're like oh maybe people do want it yeah. you know um, so yeah so so we're kind of in the works of a future you know kind of brainstorming of other, other things mm -hmm. um, um, but, you know, for her, she wanted to branch her brand, right? Yeah. So I, it's all about kind of giving and, and uh, working with that synergy. Yeah. So she wanted to be more street style for certain things. Mm. So she said, okay, well, with me, it made more sense because, you know, I, 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 I like act to work because it's comfortable, but I really want things that you can wear on the street too. Yes. Yeah. So when we were talking, we really wanted a bridge collection where you can wear it to the gym, but you can also wear it outside the gym and it looks like it's just street, yeah. you know, wear clothes. So that's kind of how the evolution of, of our conversation started. I see. And, and, and I think it continues to go down that path now. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I think about comfort on her level and on her in her world. And then she thinks about street 
wearability on my world mm -hmm. you know so that's how kind of we go back and forth yeah. yeah do you think that will be a th thing that you'll continue or yeah. even maybe not with um pop flex but with other brands as well or your own brand yes i think i think own brand there's just a lot of the resources that needs to be done yeah. you know with something like this so i think these collaborations are just a great way of me exercising my creativity without having the manufacturing production side of it yeah. you know and partnering with people who have that already yeah um yeah. it just makes more sense in that yeah. sense um but yes i would love to continue i don't know necessarily at what capacity but there is lots of things kind of brewing so we're hoping yeah see more. that's amazing yeah. i love the idea of the collaboration so i had a clothing line it's a very small capsule oh, collection yes, yes, yes your, your dresses yeah it that's was right. last year um 2021 late 2021 and i did it in collaboration with a company that was already Already producing for other influencers small capsule collections Got like this it. and they um, we brainstormed together and then came up together with the design of course they uh, sketched out all the design and then I had my input and so on and, and because I have a fashion design background I, I maybe had a bit more opinion on like mm -hmm. where the lines were going to be where the cut was going to be and it was a great way to just uh, sort of get your wheat if, no, <laughs> get your feet wet, not get your wheat wet. <laughs> I thought you do that too. <laughs> get your feet wet and yeah. just uh, try out uh, selling physical products. Yeah. So uh, for me, it was a revenue share yes. model, yes. Um, like a percentage of the revenue. Sure. And it worked out fine for me, even though uh, we stopped it. And I'm not sure how they're going anymore because I haven't been in communications. Oh. But people have been asking for it and they shut down the website. Um, but ultimately, I think there was a slight mistake with like how many orders they made Got in it. anticipation for how much I would sell. Um, and then it was there was a dis pretty big discrepancy there. And I do know that a lot of people bought it and they wore it for their Christmas outfits, mm -hmm. for weddings and all that. Um, but ultimately, the the volume wasn't quite enough mm -hmm. to justify all of the like the thousands of pieces that mm. they had ordered so that's on hold for now but I, I love the idea of these collaborations because it's a great way for influencers to not without the infrastructure setup of having yeah. inventory fulfillment uh, design all that and you yeah. can still do it yes no it's you know it's very very tough and, yeah. and if you were to kind of look at other other creators and the spaces that they occupy with the design world usually it's backed up by major yes. retailers like Revolve, Revolve and everything right Nordstrom, Nordstrom yeah. exactly right to do it yourself is extremely tough yeah. it's not impossible but yes. it's tough and it's like I think if you were just to try to figure it out mm -hmm. That's a lot of resources that you're pouring into, yeah, you know, yeah. and and sometimes those resources can be allocated, reallocated on other ways to promote the collection yeah, yeah, and not to actually yeah. create or manufacture it. Yes, you know? yes, I agree. Um, so I, 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 you know, we, I, I had a very, very, very small dabble in doing my own T-shirt. That yeah. was like, the gosh, like 10 years ago. It was, oh. yeah, when I was back in L.A. And. I just, no, that's not for me. So I, I, I'm glad that it was just t-shirts and not like a bigger, like, you know, collection that mm. required multiple, you know, items or sizes. But from learning from that experience, I just, you know, it's just not something that I yeah. necessarily wanted to do. And yeah. now I prefer having the creative side, but not yeah. necessarily the production. I see, side. I see. Um, is that also part of your experience with the CBD company that you started, the boutique store? Retail is tough. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, it's just, it's tough. And it's, for me, you know, CBD was very interesting, or cannabis in general, because, yeah. you know. I, I guess you, uh, I sh maybe I should ask you, like, the backstory um, yeah. so there's, there's some context like how did you start with the CBD yes, it's, it's and also then there was random. a retail store that, yeah that, 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 like there's fashion and CBD um, so New York just legalized cannabis yes right? um, and right now under the laws that that's 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 you know of the land um, they're going to open dispensaries later mm -hmm. but back then uh, there was no cannabis there's no mm. THC uh, but there was you know CBD that was available so from you know our side of it we wanted to kind of enter into the space when it was before it actually opened up I see. THC right? yes so the offerings are very limited in New York at the time we wanted to have a little store and it was honestly just a pop-up when we started yeah we did it and it was actually really successful and then the pandemic hit mm, and it, it completely yes. turned our world upside down because the whole block in you know that area in the West Village 
it just damaged all of us, you know. It, so it wasn't going back to kind of taking things personally. I had to really reflect hard to go. You know, I know I did everything I could because when it was opened, it was fine, right? Yeah. And then it, I wish, you know, you know many, many things, but but the pandemic, the pandemic really kind of shifted how we viewed retail experiences mm -hmm. in general. Yes. So when West Village and when you know retail opened up again, it was just not the same. And I think being in a space where you're an entrepreneur and you're a businesswoman, you just need to know when to cut your losses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And having a physical store just yeah. didn't make sense for us anymore. Mm. I was actually pregnant when we decided to to cut it because I was like, I can't not go to the store anymore because I'm pregnant now and everything. Mm. But my interest in cannabis was really because I actually I have pelvic spasm. Yeah. And I, I tried therapy. I tried like I, you know actually physical therapy to me. They go in, they try to massage your pelvic, mm -hmm. and it just nothing really worked for me. Yeah. Um. And I, I'm not one to take any type of drugs, period. Like, not even mm. Tylenol, you know, mm. usually when I'm having pain. Wow. Or Pepsid. It's, 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 I don't know why. Maybe I grew up going, your parents are like, you just deal with it, you know? And then you just go, okay, I'm just going to deal with it. So I, I really never done any of that. Yeah. Um, but this pain was very different and it, it was long lasting, meaning I've had it for, you know, 20 years and no one can give me any resolution to it. I've been to specialists and doctors and, and I really wanted to, to give cannabis a try and mm. it did. It helped. It wow. helped me with my pelvic. Um, so anyway, so that was how I got into the whole cannabis space to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember reading that story, and that was the time when THC was still THC was still kind of new. I had yes. just started trying CBD for like period pain. Yes, and it worked wonders. Yeah. It was amazing. I was like, whoa. Yeah. And I, I just haven't gone back into the habit of, of taking more, but I, I should. Um, but that was the first time that I learned that there is such a thing as like PTSD pain. Oh yes. I, I had no idea this existed yeah. Yeah. that it could stem from experiences and that your physical body Holds would that. feel yeah. pain yeah. Um, and it's amazing that you found cbd as a i guess it's more of like alleviator not yeah. a cure or yeah no it's you know there's i'm a, I'm, I'm i love science and i like having very you know very scientific thoughts behind what you put in your body um and there is loads and loads and loads of endocannabinoid receptors in your uterus and in your pelvic and everything else too um and cbd and thc addresses those receptors mm -hmm. so when i and this is learning through lots of literature and also having a doctor who was with me the whole time when I learned about that, it just gave me the sense of openness of wanting to try, yeah. you know, and, and I, there was not really that much side effects to it when mm -hmm. I was trying it. So I kept on doing it and it really helped alleviate a lot of the pains that I was going through and things that traditional medicine couldn't address. Right? Yeah. So by going through it, I just realized this was an invaluable tool to women, yeah. to people and, um, that's kind of how we kind of started on this bridge of yeah. CBD and THC. And now that the retail store is scrapped, is it still online? It's, it's, it is still online, I have to say. Having an online store that has to do with product that you actually ingest is very difficult. Mm, okay. right? Imagine that. Yeah. So if you were to buy something and you have a coat and you don't like the coat, you can return it. Yes. Right? But you're buying something that you're eating mm. or you're swallowing. Yeah. You know, It's a very different way of that consumer base is very different, mm -hmm. right? And usually our customers are ones that have been to the store and they feel very comfortable with us and they have products that they love and they come back and they have that products. Just like a lot of things in the product world and also things that you ingest too, sometimes you need your body to reboot. Meaning if you were to, this is a very poor example, but if you were to use the same hair product for for a long time, you go, yes. it's just not as effective, yes, right? Yes, yes. So your body gets used to it. Um, and that's the same with CBD and mm -hmm. THC. So you have to sometimes do a little cleanse. You have to do kind of a reboot. Um, and we walk you through this at the store very, very closely. And we monitor and track everything to make sure that you're getting the right dosage. It's very hard to replicate that online. Ooh, you know. I so see. I think it comes with its own challenges. Yeah. And it comes with, if you're an experienced person, you don't care. You yeah. are able to do everything. But I think when it comes to someone who really likes that personal touch, yeah. it was very just different to replicate that. Mm, I see, I see. I love that you had a personal experience and by sharing your story, your personal story, and you were able to 
sort of build it into a business of mm-hmm. its own mm-hmm. and then it's its separate entity now mm-hmm. um, I mean we'll see where it goes from right, here because right. there's so many challenges that you're facing as well um, but I think that's one example of how are pe- how people with influence online right. can take their experiences and turn it into a business that also helps other people right. and that's the, that's the beauty of it and that's right. why I wanted to mention it oh, thank you <laughs> but also I do feel like there is this huge pressure for creators to be like okay i'm monetizing let's say with adsense Mm -hmm. and i'm monetizing with brand deals now what's next next? i have to build a business i have to create a physical product or a digital product and we all feel like very inadequate when other people are selling like courses or they're selling clothing or they built a hotel like a boutique hotel or short-term rental and then we're like oh gosh i'm not doing enough Um, Right. And you feel like you need to do a lot. No, that's very true. And I think you have to just remind yourself that there's a lot of moving parts behind all that. Yeah. You know, and some of it is purely by sweat equity and, and, you know, and they're doing it themselves. Go them. You know, that's very hard. We built Artemis completely on our own. You know, it was very, very hard. I don't recommend that. Um, But there are people who have like the revolves of the world and the Nordstrom's of the world behind them. And you might not see that when they're launching this and they're launching that. Right. So I, I think it's very natural to be hard on yourself. But I think from my experience and seeing so many other people having their own yeah, you know, brands and, and products and everything. There's a lot of moving parts that yeah. you might not see, and it's it, it's 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 you know not not every you can't do everything all at once. Yes, you know? yes. Unless you build a huge team or you outsource it. Right, um, but right. otherwise, I do think that creators need to take it slow uh, sometimes. Which is just maybe just focus on one thing. Yeah. Right. And it's like I want to do this collaboration with this particular brand. Just focus on that. Mm. You know. And then and then. Maybe not necessarily like, oh, that's all I want to do, but have your kind of your North Star yeah. be guided towards that, yeah. right? And then and do everything else that you need to do, right? Yeah. So for me, in order for me to show that I've been successful doing a clothing line, I have this as a working example now, Yes. right? Before, I didn't even have that. Yeah. So I think for, it's just a portfolio building experience. And I think if you're able to address it more as a business in that side, it might potentially alleviate some of the pressure. Mm, yes. Yes, I love that idea. Having a North Star and having a goal and then just working towards that. And then along the way, if other opportunities oh, come, yes. then that's like a bonus. Right. Yeah. And you're, it's like if you're navigating on your ship, your ship just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes. Yeah. Right? So like it's, I think that's how, it, and it's the slow ship that gets the the goal. Yes. So you just have to kind of move a little slow and then gather all your stuff together and then make it bigger and bigger. And then when you get there, it's it's usually much, it feels much more natural and organic. Yes. I love that analogy and the, the idea that slower ships... <laughs> Can, can go further. Uh, yeah, because they, they're bigger. They have more resources. Yes, yeah? And then they sail further. Yeah. Small ships, it's like, it's hard. You're paddling yourself. Yeah. It's yeah. exhausting. And it's like, sometimes you don't even know where the North Star is anymore. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, do you have a team right now? Or is no, people helping you? It's just really? me. Really? <laughs> no. Oh my God. I don't have a nanny. Do you not, know a nanny? What? No, it's just me. <laughs> not just even me. an assistant? No, it's just me and Colin. I oh, mean, wow. Col- Colin is not a part of my business. Right. But it's, yeah, no, it's just the two of us with our daughter. We don't have a nanny. Oh, we, we, wow. don't, we don't have her in daycare it's just the two of us at home and I, I, I manage everything there do you plan to find a nanny or assistant or you know I had an assistant and I, I, th- I thought that was really helpful mm-hmm. um, I think I just have to figure out how to kind of manage yeah. that side better yeah. and then when I'm ready I can actually have that team if, if I need it I have an agency so that's different right, right. Like I'm able to kind of leverage that and, and have them help me with here or there um, and nanny I, you know, I just had a really kind of, not, it's not bad. I just had a very kind of strange experience with a postpartum nanny oh. and that kind of that Scarred slowly you a bit. traumatized oh, me. I see. So now I'm just not right. Currently right now, we don't need one now because yeah, we're yeah. both stay at home parents. Yeah. Um, but it's just my own personal trauma that I have to get through to be able to kind of trust other people with my daughter. Nothing happened to her. Not, nothing happened to yeah, me. Nothing yeah. like that. But I, I just felt like maybe... I think postpartum blues is a real thing. And, you know, mm. if, if you ever do go down that path, I want to be there for you. Um, but I just felt like she thought the nanny was her mom. Yeah. You know, and because she thought the nanny was her mom, mm. um, the postpartum nanny, that is, was her mom. Like, it freaked me out. Mm. And so when, when that postpartum nanny, they usually stay with you for duration of postpartum. Yeah. Right? So for me, it was 30 days. Um, when she left, I was like, oh, my God, no more nannies. Like, I, I don't want anyone in her life I but see. me. Because I, I think I was trying to kind of re-establish that relationship with her thinking yeah. that I was not a good enough mom yeah. 
to begin with, you know? So it's, it's my own thing. I know that. And I just have to kind of get over the hump because she's fine. She's like, you know, she understands who we are and everything. Yeah. Uh, but from that experience, I just have to kind of ease into the whole nanny thing. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. That, that's very interesting. Um, but I hope you get the help that, that you need so that <laughs> you can like, <laughs> alleviate the workload because yeah. it's so important. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned that uh, Colin is not part of the business, yeah. but he does help you sometimes yeah. here and there. So yeah. What so, kind of role does he play? So I think he's more kind of, if I need anything, he's there, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, he has a great eye, which yeah. helps a lot. So if I, I, I have a photographer that I work with, I actually have two that I really love that I work with. But if, they're like on vacation, like a holiday, right? Yes. And they're like, one of them is like gone, the other one's gone. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no one to help me shoot. Yeah. Call a step in the shoot. Mm, but see. that's that's the extent of his involvement. Oh. Like, whole shoot, I, I take the photos afterwards, I edit, I do everything else on my own, I turn everything on my own. So, like, in that sense, I, and I, you know, like, you work with your husband, right? Slightly. Slightly? He's, he's not part of the business. Oh, okay. He's not on the payroll. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So I, my ex-boyfriend, we were working really close together. Oh, wow. Like, okay. very close. Yeah. That completely ruined our relationship. Mm -hmm. it, just, it was hard. It was hard really? to thread apart who was responsible for what and, you know, and who was responsible for you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it became hard to navigate at, the, at that point. Now, as I'm older, it might be a little different, mm -hmm. you know? But back then I was, you know, first kind of starting out. So it was, it, was, it was very different. But I just, that was just not for me after that experience. So now with Colin, it's very active that we don't make it mm. a part of. Like, yeah, he's in the photo sometimes. And yeah. He helps shoot or he's like in my stories, you know, yeah. being silly. But like, he's really not like there to, mis yeah. to be necessarily like a, a team, an active team member of the yeah. brand. Yeah. yeah. I, I have found more or less the same thing mm. where we never worked together from the beginning. And in fact, he was more like, oh, that's stupid. Like, mm. what are you doing? Because um, you already had a pretty... Uh, c pretty stable career in mm. this in this area early on but for me in the beginning I was coming up when like other people were just sort of just starting to mm. get paid and mm -hmm. so there was no real example of this is the roadmap to mm. success mm. as an influencer mm. so along the way I was doing a lot of stuff for free I was mm -hmm. just like giving value for free and it felt like I was wasting a lot of time and money mm. so he was always like that's stupid like you're a smart person mm. you could put it onto a real real business mm -hmm. and you could do something good right. um, and so that that was the beginning but then afterwards when it started to really take off especially after I created my own products mm -hmm. that's when he saw the the vision of it further on mm -hmm. um and then he eventually was able to quit his job mm -hmm. because it's able to sustain us both and replace his income essentially mm -hmm. and now he actually does help me mm -hmm. but i make it so that it's not compulsory because mm -hmm. i don't want there to be any resentment mm -hmm. on his part or my part mm -hmm. either like i if we share the the profit I don't think it's fair because mm -hmm. I spent all these years doing mm -hmm. it alone Correct. and you're not really related to the foundations mm -hmm. and the, and even the entire creative process. Mm -hmm. But then he does help me with like making the finances, put, mm -hmm. putting them in order, which is actually huge mm -hmm. taxes, mm -hmm. but even dealing with life like mm. i never have to replace like a toilet mm. i never have to <laughs> wash the dishes it's so know? funny these yes, little things yes, that yes. distract you from your business You're i right. realize it, it's saving me my sanity yeah and it's giving me back a lot of time that yeah. he's actually doing for me so it's would, would you consider him like a cfo or coo he's almost a cfo he's okay. actually great at operations oh, okay he's a very practical like what do you need to do what's more important oh, yes, this is this yes, yes, yes. and i'm just more like the marketing the creative and the, the bigger vision yes yes um so he's almost become like a business consultant okay yeah okay. but i do think that's important to know is that you have to have the right personality to work together. Right. And and maybe when you first start out, you have to define the goals. I'm yeah. sorry, the roles very clearly. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and naturally, that happens to a lot of content creators. Their partners become a part of their business because, mm -hmm. you know, who else can you trust more than yeah. your partner? Yeah. Totally understandable. But I think once you're able to really define those roles of who's doing what it, it makes life a little easier yes. you know and we, when we first started we didn't have that we oh. didn't have that role model because everyone was just their husbands were shooting their yeah. boyfriends were shooting right yeah. and you didn't and you know monetization was very it was, it was very difficult back then so it, it wasn't the challenges were very different back then and it became 
like they were very invested in the brand as they should be because you know they're also with us in that sense but their identity becomes also attached to it was very difficult mm. to grow from that yes, you know yes. so it, it's just different challenges at different times yes yes delicate balance yes. where you want to give them enough credit for being involved right, at right. all but then to maybe not too involved right, where you right. argue about it right but, right right you can say you know if, if if your relationship is the most important then you have to value that first yeah 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 well i feel like that's most everything i wanted to touch <laughs> upon and and you elaborated so well on everything oh you're gosh. so articulate you're so, so sweet. it was really great um i guess uh to finish off i just want to ask like do you have some future plans or yeah. do you have a five-year goal for your brand right now you know I, now i would love to do more collaborations mm. and i think having the physical I, I want to do it because I actually really just enjoy it, mm. you know, and, and I love the process of making things come yeah. to life, you know. So I would love to kind of pursue that path uh, more. And that might be with different brands, that might be with different, you know, di different things, but it's something that we're actively working on. Yeah. M we meaning me and a little bit of my agency, meaning, you know, talking to them a lot about this. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, for me, it's like, you know, my daughter's really like my life. And I, you know, I've, I've, and this is coming from someone who's really never dreamt of like I've always wanted to be a mother it was yeah. really not that for me it was I, I was very lucky if I became a mother if I'm not I was okay with it too mm. as well um, but I was very lucky that you know she came and I love it I love the this role and I, I love being her mom and so she becomes like honestly like our, our focus yeah. you know and and it's we're hoping to be better parents than kind of the generations before us. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so to finish off, where can everybody find you oh online? Gosh. Yes. So I'm on Instagram at Winnie's Lookbook. Yeah. Um, it's also on my YouTube, Winnie's Lookbook too. And the web, and uh, I mean, the blog is all the same. It actually across the board is everything on Winnie's Lookbook. Okay. Yeah. And your most active platform right now is Instagram? Instagram. Okay. So find Wendy on Instagram, but we'll also link um, um, her work on the show notes and also her channel, plus uh, this other interview that she did, which I think it is very, very insightful. It's a podcast where Wendy shared a lot of her background, her experiences, and um, growing from the experience. And I think it's a very insightful listen and, and very inspiring for all women um, in the creative space or just, just women in general, really. <laughs> so definitely check that out. Thank you so much for Thank having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Wendy. I loved hearing her entire journey and the difficulties that she had to face throughout the years. It really shows us that as content creators, if we are consistent and we evolve with the times, then we still can have a lasting brand and lasting business like Wendy does. If you also want to learn from other creators on how they are adapting, adjusting to social media changes, as well as building multiple businesses, then definitely check out our other video podcasts right here.